is Rob Barnett, and I'd like to welcome you to today's BI Energy Exchange. This is a special year-end edition where we'll be talking through our 2023 outlooks. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to uh, just thank uh, everyone for uh, listening throughout the course of the year. And on behalf of Bloomberg, uh, thank you for your business. Um, you know, for our regular listeners, uh, we're really glad that you found this call and BI research and analysis useful. We're always just uh, instant Bloomberg or email or phone call away. If you have uh, follow up questions or questions about the research uh, in between these calls. So uh, very pleased uh, that uh, we're able to have a regular dialogue with you uh, for today's call. We've got uh, Will Hares and Patricio Alvarez uh, here in London. We've got Fernando Valley in uh, the New York City metro area. We are probably going to be joined by Sally Ilmaz from Dubai for the second half of the call. He's double booked, but he's going to try to join us to uh, share some of his insights. So, okay, uh, this year has been uh, particularly interesting in 2H as far as uh, commodities are concerned. The BCOM index which tracks a global basket of commodities has uh, has stumbled a bit, moved lower here in the second half of the year, and especially when you look at the energy segment, whether it's oil, gas, coal, you name it, I think they're trying to find their footing for 2023. So I think the best place to start is to really chat with the experts here and get a sense of how 2023 could uh, shape up. And so we'll start with Fernando. Uh, Fernando, we've for everyone who's a regular on the call, they've probably heard your your message here. But how, how do you, how would you summarize your take on where the oil market could head in 2023, and you know, what what's it mean for the integrated uh, producers? Sure, Rob. Uh, first, echoing your your message of thanking everyone for their uh, continued support and and readership and uh, viewership. Uh, but yeah, we've had a, a view that the, the economic data has just been pretty dismal, um, not just in Europe, but in North America and in China as well. And all those pressures uh, are going to weigh on the front side of the of, of, of the oil price curve, uh, at least in the beginning of 2023 and the 2022 and beginning of 2023. Remember, a lot of the ways that we've achieved some energy security in Europe has been through curtailment of uh, industrial activity. And obviously that's negative for um, for oil demand in the long term. And then on top of that, we've had uh, the issues we've seen with COVID uh, zero policies in China, curtailing demand there, and then the US consumer uh, themselves taking a bit of a hit with uh, both the used car market going uh, down very sharply and then uh, home, home uh, sales uh, stagnating as the Fed raised rates. So all of those are a cocktail for uh, demand pressure in the short term. Um, but then when we look at the second half of 2023, we think that reverse it reverses co course. Essentially, uh, we could see some some level of deflation that will actually uh, help some uh, of the consumer uh, the demand that we were talking about. Uh, you know, the, the old adage that lower lower prices are the cure to lower prices. Um, and then we think that supply con uh, supply constraints will become the really overarching theme. We've seen a lack of investment uh, throughout the global supply chain of oil. Uh, we think U.S. shale will continue to disappoint in, in its growth. Um, you know, even uh, the EIA and our partners at uh, BNEF have taken down their estimates significantly matching closer to what we've said that the U.S. shale can grow 300 to 400,000 barrels a day. It can't really grow 600 to a million barrels a day as was previously expected. Um, and so, and then other areas can disappoint and be that OPEC plus because they, they really can't uh, continue to produce at the levels that they have. Uh, Russia, because of the lack of capital and uh, services, and even my, my, my native Brazil, because uh, of the changes in policy with Petrobras, uh, you just saw today that the, the CEO of Petrobras announced he will be resigning early uh, to allow for a transition with the new ruling party in Brazil taking over and wanting, or at least stating they want to switch, uh, switch targets to increase 
refining production over upstream production. Will Harris, I want to get your take. Uh, I know you also look after the uh, the European integrated. Uh, I think that you and Fernando are largely aligned on sort of the global macro, but there are some issues that are perhaps acute to the European situation that you could highlight and you know what's one of the things that would be useful to get would be your uh, read across into the companies as well assuming that sort of macro narrative that Fernando just laid out uh, plays out uh, in in 2023. Yeah, thanks, Rob. So from the European energy major standpoint, we see uh, next year playing out uh, from a capital allocation standpoint, anyway, relatively similarly to, to this past year. We're going to continue to see um, stringent capital discipline on spending, obviously. That's going to be, we're going to see a little bit of growth uh, from new project investments and, of course, inflationary effects um, playing out through the supply chain. Um, but overall, spending is still going to be very disciplined, significantly below pre-pandemic pre levels. Uh, and, and so what this will generate is uh, excess free cash flow, which will continue to be um, deployed into these variable, flexible buyback programs um, alongside gradual dividend recovery from, from the policies that were uh, cut by 50% or more by uh, BP and, and Shell and, and Equinor and, and have made, you know, sort of gradual cautious uh, recovery since. And it, it's also um, important to, keep, to point out that these companies have, have largely achieved their, their balance sheet gearing targets um, and, and, you know, overall debt, debt reduction targets, which allows them to, you know, focus A, either on enhancing shareholder distributions, which we saw a heavy emphasis this year, and B, uh, it, it's allowing the, the this balance sheet capacity for um, planning for the future, which will be uh, dedicated mostly to um, energy transition M&A, we think. And we've already started to see that, uh, particularly in the last couple of months. We, we saw both BP and Shell step in um, in a pretty material way on uh, renewable gas, uh, biogas um, firms in both the Europe and, and the US. Uh, and, and so we think there's there's more of this to come, um, particularly as as you know the, all these companies are de-emphasizing legacy oil, um, uh, up, upstream assets, and and you know gradually pivoting this portfolio their portfolios um, to to bring them down uh, the cost and and carbon curve and you know uh, start hitting these uh, these near and and, and midterm targets for um, for. Uh, net portfolio car uh, carbon intensity. Thanks, Will. I, I definitely want to come back and sort of explore this tension between the the U.S. and European uh, oil major experience. But first, I really want to come to Patricio and get his view on the gas side of the equation. Uh, Patricio, we just heard Will talk about uh, yes. gas as a decarbonization fuel uh, that can can help perhaps with some of that intensity, uh, but I'm also curious if the same narrative might be true that Fernando described in the oil market, where I've heard a lot of discussion about the idea that we're probably okay uh, for this winter, but next winter may be more tough. Is that still the best read on the market? And uh, yeah, just go ahead and give us an overall outlook. Sure. I think um, a good place to start is <clears throat> perhaps the tempering the optimism over over the next winter. It looks like um this two first months of of the heating season so october and november were very mild in terms of uh, of weather um with uh with year over year gas demand down by about 25 percent on both um in october and november so um that that really has improved our chances of uh, of sort of weathering this winter unscathed um but but in terms of, of next winter th there are still uh, a few risks uh, but we we are a bit um a bit optimistic I, i'd say uh, but there are many caveats, of course. So first of all is um, a worst case scenario, meaning that um, uh, Russian flows stop fully um, and we have uh, colder than average rest of the winter. Um, that, that could sort of hurt uh, our storage levels by the end of this winter and, and keep them below um, their, their historical norm, which would make it harder for us to refill storages to uh, a manageable uh, level of about 90% 
uh, before October of next year. So uh, those are the risks. But if everything else, uh, you know, remains uh, as the status quo, meaning that we we have this record influx of LNG, um, sort of uh, sustaining through throughout the year, which which is also you know a, a threat of um, of Asian LNG, uh, demand for LNG sort of rebounding. Um, if if that rebounds, it will make things tougher, with obviously um, implications for prices. Um, in terms of pricing, we we still see a premium in the TTF versus the JKM LNG markers, meaning that your bull have to uh, pay a premium to lure that spare uh, LNG capacity um, onto uh, onto the continent, given that that global LNG supply uh, will be roughly flat uh, in 2023. Um, so, so that, that's sort of the, the lay of the land for, for 2023. We do see that perhaps price volatility um, will not be as, as uh, pronounced um, as the third quarter of, of this year when we saw uh, the Nord Stream 1 pipeline um, being halted indefinitely and then um, attacked or, or presumably bombed, um, which that for us marked, uh, marked the trend that the prices and supply is going to be structurally uh, tighter for for the next few years, at least until mid mid decade, where where we see um, LNG supply um, actually you know making a meaningful um, increase. Uh, so so that that's sort of how we see it. We do see less volatility, perhaps, but um, prices look poised to to stay historically elevated. Okay, so uh, potentially elevated. Uh, gas prices, oil could be bullish in 2H. Let's explore that a little bit. Fernando, I want to come back because I, I, I loved your framing of low prices being the cure for low prices. I'm, I'm used to hearing it the opposite way, I think. But um, we, you know, what are the factors that could uh, shift the narrative sooner? Is, the, is there a China reopens more quickly story? I mean, is a recession really inevitable for 1H? Sounds like that might be a little bit baked in. You know, what are, what are the factors that take us out of the uh, the sort of uh, more bearish view for the uh, first half of the year? I think uh, the China reopening is probably priced in as, as we've seen uh, Beijing continue to announce uh, uh, easing of restrictions and, and really the scraping of the COVID zero policy. So I think that's that's in the market now. Uh, what really uh, is not priced in is a mu much more resilient consumer, uh, a much softer landing than uh, currently expected. If you look at just dimensions of recessions and banks and consumers uh, earnings calls, they, they're up significantly. So there is a large degree of expectation that the a recession is inevitable and in fact already here. So if we do get a softer landing, then uh, the demand may not fall nearly as, as sharply as expected. And then we, we don't see prices coming down as significantly. Uh, similarly, if that's the case, then you know a, a Fed pivot would also uh, benefit uh, oil prices and then uh, stave off that, that 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 dip in prices that we are expecting uh, to continue. It's it's already again playing out, but we uh, we expect it could continue. Uh, and then lastly, it's uh, some major outage outage in Russia as uh, the the political situation there deteriorates. There's obviously a lot of strife. Uh, if there are any attacks or issues there, then we could see uh, uh, an impact on the, the overall supply. And even though it's not going to Europe, it is making its way to Asia and other uh, other nations that don't follow sanctions as closely. Uh, very interesting. Uh, we'll come back to you on this as well. Um, y you know, I think you and I have had discussions about the idea that uh, you know, capital returns are probably sustainable uh, under most oil uh, price scenarios. Um, is is that still your belief that you know the dividends and share buyback programs look pretty resilient, even if uh, the commodity uh, cools a little bit here in one H? Yeah. So under our base case, which is ninety dollars for next year, we have um, all the Europeans. Uh, distribution yields at around 15%. Um, now, and, and, and even under the, our bear case of $70 uh, for, for next year, dividends will almost certainly remain um, safe. Keep in mind that, that a bunch of these policies are still significantly below where they were um, pre-pandemic. 
Um, and, and you'll probably even still see some a uh, little bit of buyback flex in that bear case. Uh, so yeah, I mean, from a return standpoint, things look pretty safe. Um, and, and from a yield standpoint, distribution yield for the, for the Europeans, they are particularly attractive, um, in part explained by a, the, the pretty steep and widening uh, valuation gap between, um, between the, the Europeans and, and the Americans. Very interesting to note the uh, pretty hefty uh, dividend yield. Besides uh, an attractive yield, um, what do you think are some of the other distinguishing factors? I would note that you both have already hinted at it, uh, but well, we've got a pretty divergent set of strategies. And you know, when you look at 2023, I know that the Europeans are clearly putting more CapEx to work on uh, non-oil and gas related activity. Uh, you know, is, are any of those programs uh, going to really move any of the fundamentals in this year, next year for, for any of these companies? Or is it more about where what they look like in 2030? Yeah, it, it, from a near term standpoint, no, these are these are all, um, you know, hardly contributing any any earnings or even cash flow negative um and they're also taking up a significant chunk of capex so just last or this year sorry 2022 we estimate average um low carbon spending as a percentage of overall capex is around 15 percent and we expect this to be above 20 percent in 2023 uh, and i would note that that with bp's um biogas deal that is expected to close by year end they actually, um, uh, in, in including that, uh, were at over a third of their capex was low carbon um, oriented this year, which is a which is a record high, um, you know, obviously historically. And um, yeah, we 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 think this uh, the energy transition strategies for the Europeans are a runaway train at this point. Um, I think you could we could have two hundred dollar oil and and they would still be deploying significant if not more capex into uh into low carbon businesses they are fully committed to um a you know a more sustainable energy future and 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 there's um there's no going back now for these companies uh, Ed, fernando one more question for you just kind of on that divergence i feel like we've saw a lot of discussion about uh the engine number one and Exxon Mobil and maybe some indication that ESG type factors were going to be a bigger part of the U.S. narrative, but it, it doesn't feel like that's really uh, shifted a whole lot of at least the discussion, but maybe maybe I'm not seeing it right. So, uh, you know, what what's the role of these engine number one types and and do you do you see any of the u.s companies even remotely approaching the kind of spending uh percentages or levels that say a bp at total shell are doing yeah i i to answer the second the last part of your question first no <laughs> uh short answer is no uh i think there's been a significant shift uh Part, partially in, in the G as well. If you look at Exxon, since Engine One uh, took their three seats, uh, they made their first external hire a CFO, uh, a woman. Uh, they are increasing the diversity of their board and their management. To you know, I think there was a story on on the um, Exxon Mobil. Um, I'm blanking on the name. The, uh, uh, Empire book. I, I'm blanking now, but that at one point all. 30 top executives at Exxon were males and they all only had sons and <laughs> they all went to Texas or Oklahoma engineering schools. And so that paradigm is shifting. Uh, so the G uh, is, is shifting for sure. And then on the E side, uh, they've made, uh, they made some movement as well. You know, uh, Chevron acquired renewable energy group. They are investing in biofuels. Um, Exxon and Chevron are both making large investments in carbon capture. Uh, developing new carbon capture hubs. But as we've said before, there is a big divergence on how we're going to do the E between Europe and the US. And the, the, the US just doesn't believe in traditional renewables such as solar and wind. 
Uh, I don't think that they are going to invest. In fact, even if you go as far north as Canada, Suncor sold their wind and solar assets this year be, to focus on carbon capture and uh, liquid fuels as opposed to uh, liquid renewable fuels as opposed to traditional renewables. I think that's only going to continue to 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 accentuate that divergence. Um, they really believe that the future is by decarbonizing the existing infrastructure rather than building a uh, whole new infrastructure. And, you know, I think part of the point to, to, Will's, to Will's point, I think that if oil prices go, go to 90, then because they have such a larger proportion, their, their capital tied up in oil and gas, uh, they will benefit relative to, um, relative to their European peers. And so uh, you'll see the cash flow uh, disparity. And that's why we made the call last year that we thought the valuation gap was going to widen as it did. And we don't see it collapsing next year uh, because we see supply uh, being the, the, the driving force in the, in the equation in the second half of the year. Uh, and Exxon and Chevron are potentially going to be net cash by the, the start of 2023, which again, ensures that they will keep their dividend as they did during the pandemic and also uh, continue to return capital through buybacks. Uh, one of Chevron's big pillars is that they want to buy back as prices are low as well. So they're preserving a lot of balance sheet flexibility if there is a dip in prices to continue buybacks. So I think you were talking about the book, uh, Pr Private Empire uh, by, by Steve Cole. That's uh, it, yeah. Yeah, Thank you. yeah. Uh, to worth checking out. Uh, Sally, I see you're on. We're going to come to you in just one minute, but first I want to get uh, Patricia's view on ESG factors. And I think your companies are probably uh, front and center. Um, what's same kind of question, capital allocation strategy uh, here in Europe for the utility side of the equation. Is it is it all wind and solar, something else? Uh, let us know. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, you you can say that um, by by and large, um, the, the electric utilities in Europe are investing almost fully into um, renewable power, either via investing in uh, wind and solar developments or uh, grid infrastructure, which is geared towards power. Uh, although the grid is not entirely clean, uh, they are investing in power. It's just this bet on uh, on the electrification of things rather than than using renewable gases or, or any like sort of opposing what um, what Fernando alluded to uh, amongst the, the oil majors in the U.S. They're they're betting sort of uh, into renewing their legacy assets while here it's it's completely um, just uh, changing the whole uh, energy landscape. Um, aside from select uh, gas um, gas network operators, most utilities here are investing in wind and solar. And I think uh, what, what's important to to mention or to highlight is that. Um, new policy in the U.S., so the Infl Inflation Reduction Act is uh, becoming sort of a, a tangible um, catalyst for, for, for investment. So we've seen uh, a few of our companies sort of uh, tilt their investment uh, towards, towards the U.S. So Iberdrola is going to invest a higher share of their next five-year capex into the U.S. Uh, RWE just uh, became the second largest solar uh, power developer in the U.S. by acquiring uh, Con Edison's um, uh, renewable assets. So, so we see this uh, sort of tilt going into the U.S. just because the the IRA um, just gives these tangible credit um, tax credits, um, where where it's uh, comparing to to Europe, things things are a bit more complicated. I'd say in terms of of, of growth, um, there 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 are supply chain issues, permitting delays, and um, obviously that is in the context of an extending energy crisis, where where the like the, there's been several regulatory interventions that, that, that make things um, a, a bit tougher, I'd, I'd say, at least in, in the near term. So um, that, that's in terms of the, gro the growth capital of, of, of our companies here in Europe. But um, when we turn to shareholder distributions, uh, obviously uh, European uh, utilities are largely cash flow negative, so free cash negative, because they are under in this sort of prolonged phase of, uh, of heavy capital investments. Um, so, so there is we, we do see a risk going into next year in terms of um, shareholder distribution growth, uh, perhaps not cuts, but but definitely th there is a, yeah there is a risk of a slowdown in dividend growth, uh, just because these are these companies are highly sensitive to to um, interest rates um, and and they're 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 quite debt heavy, 
Um, so, so we flag those as the main risks um, on top of, um, of an extending energy crisis, which uh, could hold some silver linings for, for the sector, especially if volatility smooths. Uh, but we, we still expect to have high, higher power prices this year, but smoothing volatility would allow companies to sort of fetch better improved margins uh, just because they don't have that, that, um, that burden on the procurement side. Um, so, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Sally, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're wedged in between uh, two calls here, so you probably only have four minutes. But uh, I think you're very familiar with everything that we would have discussed. But we didn't talk much about OPEC. We didn't talk much about some of the Middle Eastern producers like Saudi Aramco. So uh, when you are putting on your thinking cap for 2023, uh, What's OPEC, how's OPEC going to play the market and what's a company like Aramco going to be doing? Are they going to be investing to grow production, for example? Thanks, Rob. Um, so very quickly on OPEC, uh, import, it's important to remember that they had the final meeting of this year last Sunday. And as you are familiar with, uh, I'm sure they actually decided to hold output steady. And I think uh, very quickly, I think the reason behind this was just the number of uncertainties in the market right now. It's, I mean, the EU sanctions on Russia that came into effect on Monday and on the same day, we had the price cap on Russia by G7 uh, at $60 per barrel. I mean, pretty much uh, ineffective at the moment, but I mean, if oil prices were go higher and if euros prices were to actually jump above sixty dollars a barrel uh it would be uh, more interesting to see how this is enforced and what it means uh for uh, russian oil flows and for the oil market and oil prices uh but at the same time i think on, in china uh, this is uh, i mean the developments there is very hard to follow i mean every other day we, we're pretty much hearing something different uh we thought i mean cases were on the rise and this has been kind of pressuring prices down but this week what we've been hearing is that uh, there may be some tentative reopenings following some of the protests as well so many moving parts and it's very difficult to tell what the impact would be in terms of supply and demand in the market but um, very important i think with with opec meetings they are going from having monthly meetings uh, since essentially the beginning of the pandemic, back to having only two main full meetings, one in June and one in December. They will have a, JM, a JMMC meeting, like a technical meeting in February, but there will not be a full OPEC plus meeting. So that kind of takes away that flexibility that they've had in the last couple of years of being able to jump into the market and cutting output where necessary. So I think with everything that's going on, there is a little bit of downside risk for prices in the very near term, also because the last OPEC meeting is done now and they've decided to keep output steady. I mean, of course they can hold uh, emergency meetings, but that would have to be in the case of very sharp declines in oil prices, I think. But beyond that, I mean, what OPEC might be thinking, and to be honest, what we're thinking about the oil market is, we shouldn't um, forget the China reopening if, I mean, it's very much tentative right now, but if China actually starts to reopen, gradual as it might be, this is a huge demand, but this is going to be a huge demand boost to um, uh, oil, to crude oil uh, next year. And I mean, sure, there is that 2 million barrels per day that OPEC is keeping offline, and there's a little bit of spare capacity left that that they can meet that extra demand with. But beyond that, all the things that we've talked about this year, about how we might have some supply shortfalls in the oil market, those are still relevant. So thinking beyond the very near term, uh, I think uh, the, the, the market might actually get tight again and, uh, um, and we might actually see uh, upward pressure on prices again, uh, perhaps uh, towards the middle of next year. And uh, sorry, this is taking very long, but very quickly on Aramco. Um, I mean, obviously, Aramco has had a very good year. Given, I mean, oil prices have come down a lot, but I mean, a, a brand price near $80 a barrel is still a great 
price for them. And at those levels, they will continue to generate incredible amounts of uh, free cash flow, uh, which gives them a lot of options. But as you mentioned as well, their priority seems to be spending, which is, is I mean, arguably is not the case with a lot of the international majors, but Aramco is making uh, higher spending their priority. They have a plan to increase their uh, oil production capacity by about 1 million barrels per day by 2027. So um, this is why this has been prioritized. They haven't increased their dividend. I mean, it's a whopping $75, $75 billion of annual dividends anyway. But in terms of yield, they have been trailing some of their international peers. But we continue to, um, uh, we expect to see continued uh, focus on spending. And then perhaps some special dividend or a dividend hike might be on the table if oil prices continue to be uh, at elevated levels. That's it from me. Thank you, Sally. Uh, so hang on, I have an, uh, two follow-up questions if you have time to stay with us. And for everyone listening, we, we're going to take an extra five, 10 minutes here and do do a couple of uh, quick questions that I think will be fun. So Sally, we're going to put you on the spot. So. You and I have been chatting a fair amount about GPT-3. For anyone who hasn't heard of it, this is this new AI chatbot generated text. Uh, we, we've done some fun things like write an analysis of the oil market in the style of a Bloomberg Energy analyst. Surprisingly good prose, right? So um, do you think that um, you know GPT-3 is going to sort of impact your professional career, or and are there sort of any implications in the energy sector for this really interesting, uh, very recent technological uh, development? I think so. I mean, the couple of things that we tried, um, it was good, but not great. But that actually in turn is great for me because I know that it's not going to replace me and my job uh, anytime soon, which is good to see. Uh, but I think in terms of applications for uh, for us, I think it can actually become a much more powerful Google type of search, right? Because of course, in, in what we do, um, sometimes there is something going on in Africa, which is not exactly something that we look at every day, but it suddenly becomes relevant because something, let's say, blows up uh, in Nigeria and it's very important for the oil market, but we don't really know perhaps enough about that. But I think something like this could be like an enhanced Google search to get you up to speed on something that suddenly becomes relevant for what you do. Um, so that's the main application that I can think of uh, for us where, um, you know, it might be something that we, we don't look at every day, but have to because of something that may have happened in some part of the world that's important for uh, for the oil market. Um, but, but but yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to hear uh, your, your thoughts on this as well. So so we'll save we'll save everyone else's thoughts. But one more question for you, because I know you got to run. Uh, so, Sally, uh, when you think about 2023, you know, we've generally shared our outlooks. But, you know, if, if you had to sort of pick one item, one thing that you think will be surprising to the market uh what you know what what's your crystal ball say you know what 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 are, what are you looking at the most what 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 could uh, be be the curveball that no one's anticipating um i mean this is not too much of a surprise maybe to some but i think that uh some of the european refiners will actually continue to do quite well i think a lot of people are thinking that they had an amazing year especially towards the middle of the year um, they really, I mean, the, we had record margins that were really driven by, I mean, the supply constraints that we had because of uh, the crisis in Europe, uh, but also export curbs in China and some of the refinery shutdowns that, that came from before. Uh, and obviously we, do, we are seeing margins falling from those levels and I think might continue to fall a little bit. But I'm actually expecting very, still very robust margins for many of the refiners uh, in our coverage, which I don't think uh, might be um, might be the consensus right now. And I think the main driver for that uh, will be diesel. I think we have become a little bit complacent about the actual sanctions, uh, actually EU sanctions on Russia which was December 5, uh, uh, beginning of this uh, week for crude, but we have one that's coming up in February for oil products, including diesel. And diesel is very important because Europe uh, used to import a lot of diesel. And with that in mind, I think 
we had multiple CEO refiners uh, in Europe say we are very likely to have diesel shortages. So in turn, I think this will uh, give very strong uh, crack spreads for diesel, and I think in turn that will really support refining margins, not at the levels that we saw in the second quarter this year, but still very strong and probably double-digit uh, refining margins that I don't think many um, many might be expecting, but I think uh, refining margins in Europe might actually surprise to the upside. All right, cool. Thank you, Sally. Uh, feel free to stick around. But uh, so on GPT-3, from, from my perspective, I think it's going to, uh, you know, make it more economic to have lots of... Um, well-written prose, and um, you know, maybe, maybe in some sense it turns uh, folks like us into uh, somebody who has a scaffolding pre-written for them, and they have to sort of edit it and massage it into something that is workable. I know for anything I tried, there was definitely some looseness with the facts, and I think it's probably comforting for everyone listening to know that you know we're real people. Uh, you, you can uh, you can see our video here. You can uh, talk to us, and hopefully that's going to be something that uh, folks want in the market for, uh, I believe, the foreseeable future. Uh, but that being said, it's pretty cool. So uh, uh, yeah, Will and Patricio and Fernando, uh, any AI applications uh, that you're seeing either in sort of the profession of uh, doing research and analysis or in um, in applications in the energy sector. Will, we'll come to you first. Yeah, I, I think there's gonna be a lot of applications. I don't know about chat GBT3, but um, you know, for, we're already starting to see some, you know, digital, dual digital models of, of infrastructure, um, uh, you know, using neural networks uh, to, to try and, you know, stress pipeline uh, vulnerabilities and, um, and and other sort of infrastructure vulnerabilities. So I, I think there's there absolutely will be a lot of applications for 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 within the um, within the operational oil and gas uh, space. In question, I, either you or Fernando might know this, but for years uh, the oil majors were always at the at the sort of top of the list of the sort of companies that had uh, access to or owned operated the fastest supercomputers in the world. Uh, I, I don't know if they've kind of fallen by the wayside with the Googles and the other sort of tech companies maybe uh, taking the top spots, but uh, at least the last time I saw, I'm pretty sure pretty much all, all of the coverage for, for both you and Fernando were, were in the top 20. I, I think that's still in the top 50, but uh, as you said, the Googles of the world and those trying to solve quantum computing are probably have the, the more powerful um, computers nowadays. Uh, just, you know, you probably don't need as much on the, on the oil and gas side as you do to solve quantum. Um, and then I think as, as Will alluded to, they are making investments, but there's been a fair amount of call it offshoring um, you know, moving some of those technology investments to uh, to equity investments or just uh, completely third party providers. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of satellite data um, uh, helping to try to gauge um, to gauge uh, uh, inventory levels. I know there's there are companies working on uh, sensors uh, that are more uh, corrosion um, corrosion. Uh, resistant to, to be able to better measure inventory levels uh, for producers. There's also uh, technology tracking cell phones and computers and et cetera to, to be able to judge activity uh, in different well uh, regions. Uh, obviously, better monitoring of the wells and leaks on pipelines and um, uh, other areas to, to, to reduce the carbon intensity of production. And then I think the biggest part is probably uh, the the ability to better model uh, reservoirs and productivity uh, by processing more data and aggregating more of the uh, of what you already have in house to to create better predictions for your uh, eventual productivity. Patricia. Sure. I, I, I think um, in terms of what, what it means for, for my job, I think I just uh, I, I hope yeah, Rob is right uh, and 
Um, and on the other hand, in terms of uh, my, my sector, uh, we, we're already seeing the, these sort of um, type of technologies being applied on, on the field. So um, there's a massive upside to uh, digitizing uh, power networks and grids uh, towards uh, being more efficient, reducing energy losses, be it gas or power. So, uh, and we're already seeing this with uh, with the, the, the deployment of, uh, of smart meters. I think um, that's that's not done yet, but, but that's part of like the, the, the the, the first uh, step in trying to integrate sort of the the internet of things into the grid and and for utilities is, it, it will be a very important thing and also for consumers so it is um it is something that we we think the energy crisis might actually take um you know kick into shape uh, people's uh interest in in managing and in monitoring monitoring their their consumption and that will allow for increased efficiencies and um and amongst um, our group in, of utilities we see peers that are sort of pioneers in, into the digitization of networks space uh, as as the stronger uh, and stronger ones in terms of uh, optimizing costs so so we do see uh, more more opportunities on, on the power side for sure okay cool so we'll do a quick round robin here on the thing that might be most interesting or surprising in your franchise for the year? I'm gonna go first. Uh, Alessio, my associate and I, you can see him sitting over your shoulder there, Patricio. We had a really interesting note on solar plus battery storage. We think this is gonna be a really big theme in 2023. Uh, it doesn't completely solve the intermittency problem. It doesn't mean solar plus batteries are the only solution. We just think that they're going to be uh, a big part of the 2023 narrative. Uh, if you look at the economics of solar paired with a battery, uh, in mo many markets around the world, it is a, a pretty economic uh, decision, it's particularly with these uh, elevated uh, natural gas prices. So take a look at our note. Uh, could be a, a very big uh, theme for some of the solar exposed names next year. Uh, Will, we'll come to you next. Yeah, I, so I think um, renewable gas is going to be a big theme next year. This is a this is a really good lever for the energy transition oriented majors because obviously it is about as aligned as you can get to their um, you know traditional business models while uh, providing that decarbon decarb lever that um, that Fernando mentioned. And so I I think we're going to see a lot more of this. Um, this style of uh, uh, energy transition investment, which we haven't actually seen a lot of yet, um, and 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 yeah, I'm I, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, to seeing that that theme play out next year. Patricio. Yeah, so I don't have uh, I don't think I see big changes in terms of the capital allocation or or sort of like the growth drivers for my industry, but if if anything. Um, what, what's important to highlight, I'd say, is that the cash flow outlook for, for my companies uh, could surprise to the upside next year, as they, uh, most power generators have been able to hedge um, their, their sales at higher prices, meaning that once uh, power and gas price volatility subsides somewhat, um, they, they will have this, this wider sort of margin headroom. Um, and the other part is uh, something that I will keep a close uh, eye on is um, more uh, more European um, utilities sort of investing or dipping their toes in, into the U.S. I, I think that that is com becoming um, a really important theme uh, in terms of other utilities just realizing that their global footprints are overstretched and perhaps not at the, with the scale and, and synergies that they expected. And we do see sort of a reshuffle in terms of the geography uh, for some of my companies. And especially, I think the U.S. could be, um, yeah, could, could, could be a good place to 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 sort of uh, extend their growth especially because of the the, the policies that, that we're seeing emerge great fernando what are you looking for well i'll go i'll go the complete opposite way out of renewables i guess the u.s and europe uh going separately again uh, but i think it's a, re a return to exploration i think we'll see as i said that supply gap emerging in the second half of 2023 I will realize that uh, we can't fill that gap with OPEC and uh, U.S. shale. So we'll have to go back and uh, try to find new new sources of oil and gas because it's it's going to be here for a while. Uh, and, uh, and and again, we haven't really done a lot of exploration since 2016. And that may be more drilling rigs. That may mean more um, more uh, leases being made, uh, not just in the U.S. but outside as well. 
that could be a revisiting of Western Africa, which has been really dormant since uh, 2015 when the oil price uh, first crashed. So I think that a return to exploration in, in West Africa beckons in, in the second half of 2023. Love it. I think it's interesting. Uh, possible that all of these could play out. They're not necessarily in conflict. So let's see how it goes. Um, so I want to thank everyone for their time today. Please shoot us an email or an IB if you've got follow-up questions. If you're not in our BI Energy Exchange chat, uh, let us know. We're happy to add you. Pretty active discussion from not just us, but uh, uh, Bloomberg clients who are interested in the energy markets. So uh, we're happy to get you in that chat if you're not. And uh, if you want to be added to our mailing list, uh, just reach out to any one, one of us. We'll make sure you've got the information you need. And uh, I hope you have a great end of year. And we look forward to continuing these discussions. The first one, I think tentatively, we're going to do that first uh, January, uh, first Wednesday in January, so January 4th. So keep an eye out for that. Take care. And I hope you have a great uh, end of the year. Thanks, everyone.